Playing your original classic consoles on flat panel TVs used to be a pretty complicated process, but now there's devices out there that are plug and play and pretty easy to use. There can be some confusion though, as some of these devices really harm the signal and add what might be the most harmful part, lag. So this video is gonna do some lag testing and show you which are the best scalers to use across all different price points. While there's many different factors in how to get the best experience from your classic consoles on flat panel TVs, this video is only gonna focus on one section of that, the lag that's introduced from the scaler you use. Now, of course, using wireless controllers could possibly add lag as well, and your flat panel display itself will most likely add some lag, which is around one frame or 16.5 milliseconds for your average TV, and it could go up to two or three frames, or as low as just a small fraction of a frame if you're using something like a high-speed gaming monitor. So that's just something to keep in mind that regardless of what the scaler adds, you're still gonna have to deal with panel latency as well. And another goal of this video is going to squash the myth that a little bit of lag doesn't matter. Because if you see these numbers the way I'm gonna be displaying them and you envision them with the added lag of your TV, it really puts things into perspective of how you don't need to be a professional gamer to really have your experience ruined by two laggy solutions. So let's take a look at what we got. To perform these tests, we'll be using a TimeSleuth lag testing device configured to output 240p and 480i, the same signals most classic consoles output. I'll then be running it through a digital to analog converter, or DAC, to convert the HDMI signal to RGBHV. We'll use a 5BNC cable to break out RGB to be plugged directly into the monitor, then use a passive sync combiner Steve from HD Retrovision built for me to safely combine H and V sync into C sync. As a note, never use a basic Y cable to combine sync. Always use some kind of sync combiner device. So now that we have the whole setup ready, I'd like to test it just to make sure that all of the components we've added don't add any lag by themselves. Now with analog video signals, the time it takes from the signal to enter the back of the monitor and begin to be drawn on the top left corner of the CRT will be zero milliseconds. So let's confirm that's what we're seeing. As you can see, there are zero milliseconds of lag added to the signal. Any of the numbers to the right of the decimal point are microseconds, and in the context of retro gaming, anything under one millisecond should be considered zero lag, as no console can pull faster than that. As a note, a CRT draws its signal from left to right, one line at a time until it reaches the bottom, and starts back over at the top. It'll take about seven milliseconds for the signal to get to the middle left of the tube and 16.5 to get all the way to the bottom right. Because of the underscan setting, this monitor is showing about 14 milliseconds at the bottom left, which seems about right. But if we could test the bottom right corner, it would show about 16. Now, since the output of these scalers is HDMI, we'll need a second DAC to convert the signal from HDMI to component video, which will be routed to the back of the RGB monitor. I've tested this device many times before, but let's be thorough and check once again. As you can see, there are zero milliseconds of lag added to the signal. Once again, please don't pay attention to the microseconds in these tests, as we only care about milliseconds in retro gaming. So now that we've individually tested all our equipment and proved there's zero lag, let's go over the main test chain, which is the same stuff we just showed, but in slightly different order. We have the time sleuth going into a VGA DAC through the sync combiner. Then we're using a BNC discard adapter to go into the RetroTINK 2X SCART, which we'll be testing first. Then that outputs HDMI to the second DAC, which is now sent into the 480p compatible CRT monitor. As you can see here, the RetroTINK 2X SCART is showing zero milliseconds of lag. Please remember that the 2X SCART features the same exact components as all of the RAD 2X cables. I already lag tested those in other videos, so feel free to check those out or even double check yourself. But as I'm proving here, every single component in this chain is lag free, including the RetroTINK 2X SCART. Now let's test the open source scan converter with the exact same setup chain. 
As you can see here, it adds zero milliseconds of lag to the signal in 480p mode. This shouldn't be the least bit surprising though, as retro gamers have been testing the OSSC in all of its output modes for the past few years, and it always shows zero lag, but it's nice to show some solid numbers once again. Let's move on to the Frame Meister. As we can see, it's showing just over a frame of lag, not really varying. Your average gamer probably wouldn't notice one frame, but it's something hardcore gamers would probably notice, especially when you consider that your average TV might add another frame or two. Now let's switch the time sleuth to output 480i to see how the frame meister reacts. As you can see, the lag jumps to about two frames. It's an interesting trade-off as the frame meister's deinterlacing looks great, but that one extra frame of lag and the cost of this device might make it a deal breaker. Honestly, while the Frame Meister was pretty revolutionary for its time, I've always felt it was much too expensive, and there's better and cheaper options available today. As a note, I wanted to test the HDMI port of the Frame Meister, but it just wouldn't work right with the Time Sleuth. I've never had issues with it before, so that was a bit weird. I'd assume that if you're scaling the signal through the HDMI port, the lag would match the analog ports, so expect one to two frames. Now I'd like to test out some of those generic HDMI cables that claim to be designed for use with classic consoles. To do so, I hand-wired a SNES multi-out into a prototype sync combiner device. It's basically the same DAC as before into a different kind of sync combiner that outputs to a SNES jack, but since I don't want to leave any doubt in people's minds about the tools that I'm using, let's lag test this too. No surprise here, that device outputting to a SNES RGB cable is zero lag. Now we can confidently test some of those HDMI cables and see how they perform. So now let's test the infamous pound cable. And it's terrible. <laughs> Look at how much the latency varies. It's bad enough that there's a lot of lag, but it never stays in the same place. That's the real killer with these cables or with any devices that use chips that were meant to be used with TV signals, not video games. If the lag varies that much, it'll be impossible to adjust your timing since it's never the same thing twice. Heck, even if we deduct a few milliseconds because the 16 by nine image is towards the middle of the screen, you're still looking at one to three frames of constantly varying lag. I know all of these cables are supposed to be the same, but let's test the level height cable and it's not working at all. After messing with the setup, I realized the issue. The level height cables use composite video as sync, not C-Sync but the cables are unshielded. So that's why the level hikes looked worse than the pounds in my previous tests. Ugh. Anyway, I moved sync to the different pin so we could start testing and holy shit, this thing is variable up to five frames of lag. Well, it looks like I owe the retro gaming community a giant and sincere apology. For the past few years, I've been telling people that any of these console to HDMI cables that look the same all perform the same, and man was I wrong. Some of them perform bad, but others apparently perform really, really bad. I was absolutely appalled at the level height cable, between the quality of the signal itself, how bad it processes the image, and that insane amount of lag, that would make any game unplayable for anyone playing anything other than a turn-by-turn -turn RPG. And this is not professional gamers and fighting games. I imagine playing Super Mario World would be really challenging and almost impossible to follow with the variable latency. So to put things into perspective, I think if this was a car that was released like this, there would be a global recall. So it's too bad you can't do these with these cables, but anyway, back to the testing. So since we're testing bad scalers, I've got to test that SCART to HDMI box, and I'll be doing it with a SNES cable, just like the others I've tested. After being constantly bombarded by trolls who tell me I'm lying about the lag this thing outputs, I was pretty happy to see that my test results were once again verified. <laughs> That's right, it's the worst one. Variable lag of three to six frames. When connected to a typical TV, that's going to average at least seven frames, but could hit 10 frames if you're using a wireless controller and just a slightly slower TV. That would make this device completely unplayable for anyone, not just hardcore gamers. 
Heck, even the HDMI pass-through adds variable lag of one to two frames. I think the important thing to remember about this scaler is it was never designed for video games. This was only meant as a device to scale TV signals. I did a whole video about it if you'd like more information and some good uses for it, but please stop using this for gaming. On a lighter note, since I took the time to build that SNES converter, I figured I'd test the HD Retrovision cables. I think we all know how this is going to end, but I wanted to show one more time how the equipment we're using affects lag, because it really doesn't. As expected, the HD Retrovision cable adds zero milliseconds of lag to the signal, even when everything is run through the DAC and sync combiners we're using. I never thought otherwise, but now you could have some more peace of mind about it. Also, I figured since we have everything set up, let's just test that same HD Retrovision setup through a RetroTINK 2X Pro. Once again, zero lag added. As a note, both the RetroTINK 2X Pro and 2X Classic, as well as all of the RAD 2X cables, perform the same in both 240p and 480i. Just for fun, I also wanted to test the RetroTINK transcoders. Here's the RGB to comp using the same sync combiners as earlier. And lastly, here's the opposite, the comp to RGB using the HDMI to component video DAC we tested before. No shock, zero lag as well. Before I go, I wanted to show tests from another device I'll be reviewing soon. I won't go into too much detail here, but it's that cheap GBS scaler I've been hearing people talk about for years. In its original form, it processes all 15 kHz signals as 480i and adds variable latency of 1 to 2 frames of lag. It's not something I'd recommend for most people, but it definitely had some uses. But here's how the lag looks with custom firmware called GBS Control that was created for it by one developer. 240p is processed correctly and sits at a non-varying 4 milliseconds of lag. That's amazing for a device that cheap. Then 480i shows variable latency between 0 and 1 frame, including when using its adaptive deinterlacing modes. That's less than the FrameMeister for both resolutions. Also, the pass-through modes don't add any lag at all in any resolution, which means the GBS scaler with a custom firmware can be safely used as a component to RGBS or RGBHV converter. Lastly, the GBS custom firmware can downscale an image, and downscaling 480p to 240p results in only half a frame of lag. As far as I know today, that makes it the fastest downscaler available. I'll have a much more detailed video on this soon, but the GBS with the custom GBS control firmware seems to be a great choice for do-it-yourselfers who don't mind a bit of hardware and software setup to get things started. Well, I hope this video was able to put things into perspective for most people, and hopefully those solid numbers being shown on the screen would really drive the point home of how bad some of these solutions are. Remember that if they're using chips that were designed for TV signals and not video games, you can't blame the hardware. You could only blame the manufacturers lying and saying that they're supposed to be used for video games, or you could blame other people that have accidentally been telling people use these video scalers for games. But overall, I hope people get a good sense of what to expect and what to stay away from. Things like that four milliseconds of lag on the GBS custom control scaler, I think that one's a perfectly good solution because a quarter of a frame of lag-ish isn't going to be something that almost any gamer, including hardcore gamers, would ever notice, especially because it's not variable at all. It really was just solid around four milliseconds. Devices like the FrameMeister might start pushing the limit because of it just over one frame of lag or two frames in 480i mode, plus whatever your display adds to it. That's kind of cutting it close. But if you already own one, I would just use it and be happy. I just wouldn't recommend anybody go out and buy it because while it was pretty awesome when it was released, there's just so many other much cheaper options to the point that you could buy two or three different solutions to do the same thing that the FrameMeister does with zero lag and in some cases better performance depending on what you're looking for. So overall, I just hope that people take these numbers and treat them the way that you should treat them as nerdy analytics. 
Don't get emotional about your purchases. Don't get emotional about an inanimate object that you bought and you found out maybe it wasn't supposed to be used for video games. It happens to everybody. It happens to me. I would just approach all of this stuff pragmatically and say, okay, cool. These are the companies and the scalers to stay away from. These are the companies and the scalers that obviously are really working as hard as they can to get products out designed specifically for retro gamers and the ones in between like the do-it-yourself projects and everything else. So hopefully this could be a great educational tool that finally squashes the myth that a little bit of lag doesn't matter because in most cases it really does. Well, that's it for this time. If you enjoyed this video and want to see more like it, as well as keep up all of the behind the scenes research and development I'm a part of, please consider signing up for Patreon and Floatplane because those support services are what's keeping all of this stuff alive. Also, if you'd like to be kept in the loop of everything going on in the retro gaming scene, please check out the weekly podcast available every Wednesday, both as a video and everywhere audio podcasts can be found. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time.